I'm happy to be here and talk a little bit about uh, the UMX Creator. And uh, as I was already introduced, I'm here in the US responsible for the Americas market. So not only the US, but the whole of America. So if you have any topics, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I'm fairly sure that a lot of uh, people have heard about UBMAX and what we do, but for the ones that have not, uh, we're focused on the industrial AR market, and we help big companies to improve their manual labor processes by introducing augmented reality and wearable computing in general. So our slogan is, we're IT at work. So that's what we are really focusing on. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges that companies have and some of the things that have been hindering us from really getting that off the ground initially. And uh, one of the topics that is really around that is content. So as you know, most of the people in the room are probably from one of the sides. You either have tried to implement something, uh, a scenario, or you have actually implemented a scenario for someone. So you're on a vendor or on a buyer side probably. And one of the challenges is really with augmented reality that it's relatively, or it was relatively complex to build a scenario. So you need to tailor it very specific so, to a scenario and then it's not necessarily very transferable to another scenario. And you need very specific knowledge to do so. So that's kind of the challenge around it. So it's a lot about content and how you get that content out to the people really. And uh, let's, let's take a look at what has happened already in the market and what we did and uh, where we feel like we're at. And I think most of the talks that you hear, they're focusing a lot on the, uh, on the people and where we're at and what they do with the solutions. And what we can say is that actually the, the workers, they have already benefited quite a bit. So most of the workers, they have uh, tried it and uh, they, they quite like it. It makes their life easier. Um, so they like having the information in a hands-free kind of way where they need it and, uh, and to really use it. So it makes their lives easier. What about the companies? Companies also like it because it's, it's saving them time and money and it's, it's more high quality. So just to give you a few figures, I would say that in most of our deployments we see a performance increase in terms of speed, somewhere between uh, 15 to 50 percent. That's probably some of the figures that we would see overall. And uh, in terms of the quality, I would say that it's uh, at least around 10%. Most of the companies don't like to share numbers around that, so I have to be a little bit careful what I say. But 10% more accurate is, is probably a pretty good assumption. And they're more flexible. So now suddenly they have a workforce which they can deploy and uh, really in a different way. So I always like to think of a company like Nokia that used to uh, do rubber boots at some point in time and then they moved into the smartphone business and now they may need to go somewhere else. So if you're Nokia and you f figure out what you want to do, it doesn't really mean that you have already enabled your workforce to do that. So you need to find a good way to roll out these new ways of working to the people. So these are kind of the, the, the challenges for the companies. So. As we move the focus away a little bit, um, it's not only changing the way for the worker, but it's actually changing um, the way for people around the workers as well, for the supervisors. Because um, just because uh, the worker is faster in fixing a certain machine, it, it doesn't mean the content is miraculously appearing there. They used to have manuals, and now and the supervisors need to provide that kind of information in an intuitive way to the workers, right? And uh, the content creators. And this is what we have been thinking a lot about in the, in the past year and we have been working on. And the UBMX creator is a tool that can be used to do that. And uh, the, the shop flow managers, they really need some enablement and some tools to produce these workflows and these instructions and to, to get the information to the people in an intuitive kind of way quickly to, to get that content out there. And that can be challenging. Yeah? So why is that challenging actually? Because if we look into different segments, for example, if we look into um, finance and controlling, for example, they're standard procedures. Yeah? But as we move into these core business processes, most of the companies consider this type of knowledge their core IP. This is how we do things. This is not, we will not share this. So it's very difficult to come up with a generic process that fits all airplane manufacturing, car manufacturing, 
And even not, not the manufacturing processes, also the logistics. A lot of companies would also consider the logistics processes their very core IP where they think they do a lot of things very unique and they wouldn't want to share that. So that's why it's very difficult to define a, a standard that fits all of them. Eventually, maybe there will be one, but right now there's not, and that makes it a little bit challenging. So we've, we've done a little bit of investigation with our customers here, and uh, so the question is, how do customers want to deal with that? And uh, there is, um, the idea behind it is, do, do they really want to produce their own workflows? Maybe they don't, maybe they just want a standard workflow, but that's not the case. We, we found out that most of the customers they really want to be self-sufficient, about two-thirds. They, they really want to do their own thing. And then there's maybe around one-third um, that, that needs support in, in, in getting these kind of instructions to the people because they want to do something very complex and they cannot manage to do that themselves. So that's kind of what, what we found out. And uh, one of the motivational things behind it, why, why companies want to do that, is because uh, when you take a look at all the different elements in a total cost of ownership um, consideration, the customization as it was, I mean, it used to be a lot of coding, now it's configuration in terms of uh, putting things together, is, is usually the, the most uh, expensive piece of, of such a project when you, when you consider all the different cost pieces. So they na very naturally want to address this, this kind of segment to, to become better there. So what you try to do is you try to move away this customization and you not try to replace that with enablement, really enabling the people to do what they need to do themselves. So that's, that's what we are focusing on. And how, how do we do that? And uh, we, we feel like the, the customer needs a tool and it needs to be um, graphically supported to really put together these instructions, these step-by-step these, uh, -step instructions are also branched out. They can be very complex, I can tell you. Um, can be very complex instructions. And also the interactions. And to just put a little bit of a twist to it, because it's, it's not only customers that I'm talking about, but also partners. Because eventually, uh, partners that we collaborate with, they would also want to bring out their own solutions. So they actually want to uh, bundle them up and, and really uh, offer them as their own solutions. And uh, sometimes to external companies, sometimes internally in their company. And there is different stakeholders in this process. So if we, we already talked about the, the shop floor manager. So he needs something. He's usually the guy who has the knowledge, he knows how it's done, but it's not necessarily an IT guy most of the times. And so he needs something that is relatively simple and uh, where he can put together stuff uh, very quickly, relying on his personal knowledge, not on IT knowledge. And then you have the IT department, and the IT department is an enabler. It's an enabler for the business, so you want the IT department to be able to create new type of content and not necessarily a, a very, um, a, a, just a one piece, but a reusable thing, yeah? A, a reusable component that is available then for the shop floor manager to, to use. And uh, the partners, they really, as I already talked about it, they want to have their own solutions which they offer to their customers. And our creator is, is allowing to do that. So there's different elements to it, and it's very difficult to cover that in uh, a short presentation like I have it here. I try to cover some of the core elements, which is uh, the workflow. So I have a little workflow here, which is, is building up. And you can see it's not a linear one. You can uh, backtrack and, and have uh, logic in there. You can branch out and, and do these, these kind of things and uh, allowing for very complex interactions. And this workflow is then actually executed and run on the glasses themselves. And it can be used in all different kind of context. So it's not only, uh, as, as it sounds very natural, in a, um, in a manufacturing or an inspection context where you say, oh, okay, I need to do this, 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 this. But also when you look into logistics and you move goods from A to B, that's also a process. It's not a very long process, but it's very iterative. You keep doing the same thing and that also needs to be configured in the same engine running that. When you think about integration points, you also want to 
integrate with backend systems sometimes. You want to pull information from the backend and, and get that and make it available for the people, or you want to push information to the backend so you can have integration points in there, and you have user interaction. So these are typically the two points that you have in these, in these kinds of workflows. So you have your natural voice, you have the buttons, and most of you probably know the devices and the different means of interaction. That can be configured so anybody uh, can do it that has the knowledge on the actual process. And once you have created that content, that content then needs to make its way over to the devices. So you need to deploy it. You need to make it available to the people. So someone is going to sit down and is going to structure the team structure. Okay, I have Josh here, and uh, he, he's part of my maintenance team. So I put it in the team, and then I, I assign them certain work procedures which they can work on. So the deployment also needs to happen. It needs to happen in a very seamless kind of way so that Josh uh, is then, when he gets the instructions, he uh, he doesn't need to do much. He just puts on the device and it automatically finds its way to him. I mean, and this is what, um, what is very critical when we move from these initial POC type of work into these larger scale deployments to enable these automatic processes in terms of getting the information that you want to get out there and then automatically transferring it out there. Because if you're uh, in a larger deployment, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And that's why we've been focusing on that to support these, these type of deployments and have the, the infrastructure that everything runs run smoothly for them. I have a little video here uh, which I wanted to share with you and it's uh, showing you what is possible um, by using these, uh, these tools really. It's, it's focusing a little bit on the different capabilities that we have and it should come up shortly when he hits another uh, time the, the key so we can see all the different. I'm, I'm like, gonna let it run for a second. Start work. So that's a logistics context, context aware where you are. You have a very graphical visualization of what you want to do. That's all configurable then, what that looks like. You have different interaction points like smartwatches. You can tap into, you can use the camera to scan certain things. You can use external devices to scan things. You have navigational elements showing you where to go, helping you to go through your enterprise, interaction with voice. Then you have interaction possibilities, so your supervisor can push you messages, he can take a look at where you're at. You can integrate into IoT sensors all around in the environment, um, picking up certain data. You can use this for instructions, but also to intake information using the camera, visual inspection processes. You take pictures, you take videos of what you see out there. Um, you can do the remote assistance calls. That's all fully integrated, so it's a seamless solution. You don't need to get one piece and then restart the other, but it's really a fully integrated process. So that's, uh, what the, that's the beauty of having a platform that basically combines all these elements and makes them available. So from an architecture perspective, you have the platform that allows you to do these features. You just log on to the platform with a Chrome browser. You, you do what you need to do in terms of creating content, taking calls, do all that, administer, and then you have the, the guys wearing the devices out in the field that have access then to that information and uh, have it available uh, at the time at, when they need it. So the beauty is um, you don't need a special IT training to do that, uh, which is critical uh, to scale really. Um, it's also very responsive. There's version control in it. You can push it out at the time when you, when you need it. You can update it very quickly. You can uh, save alternatives and switch between them. You can try out different work instructions and see what works better. And then focus on the one that, that uh, really uh, gives you the benefits that you want. You, your data is protected. Uh, that's one of the key elements. I think most of the big enterprises, they may be willing to start in a cloud environment, but eventually they are afraid about leakage of their IP. So they would probably not keep their system in the cloud, but rather put it on premise or at least in their own cloud and uh, where they feel like they have more control over it. And uh, so you uh, have your data protected in the system that runs on premise in your environment 
and uh, have, have the confidence that nothing is leaking out of there. And you're self-sufficient. You don't want to pull someone in. And as much as they like working with us, they, they also like when they can do things themselves and they're not relying on us and can do whatever they need to do um, in a, in a self-sufficient kind of way. So that's what I wanted to share with you today, and I'm happy to answer some of the questions. And I hope to see some of your faces over at our booth at uh, 519 tomorrow when we, we open the exhibition area. OK. Thank you, Percy. There's some questions for you already. There's questions? Yeah. OK. One interface of workflow kind of was real in presentation, or was it just a visual model and real interface is different? The answer is yes and no. It looks a little bit different. Um, we, we made a few elements a little bit bigger just to um, make it a, a more visual experience for you. But it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Come over to our booth and check it out. It's, it's very close to, to what I showed on the, on the screen, actually. And you take your own judgment then on that. Uh, but I, I think it should be very similar. Is your platform working with AR and 3D objects? If yes, how Shopflow Manager puts 3D content in the workflow process during its creation? Uh, most of the companies currently, they would focus on um, head-up displays that are not necessarily doing full-blown 3D object in that space. Do we do that as, as UBMX? Yes, we do. And we have certain creator elements for that as well. But most of the companies, as they um, use our solutions not for training, but during their everyday life, the whole day for eight hours, um, they would rely on devices that are a little bit smaller, um, like um, a, a Google Glass, realware device, Vuzix M300, Toshiba brought a new device out. We just closed a partnership with them. Uh, great device. And the, the beauty is the devices are lightweight and you can move them out of the way so it's not obstructing your view when you, when you work. Um, do we work with the binocular devices as well? Yes, we do. ODG, Epson, Microsoft HoloLens, Dacry Smart Helmet, uh, Meta, they, there's a lot of them as well. They have a little bit different use cases. You would probably use them in use cases where you don't work for eight hours. And this is when you would use the 3D content that you produce. And the last question, do you have computer vision in your, uh, yes, definitely do. We, um, computer vision is a key element. Um, there's very obvious things in the logistics when you pick up codes and things like that. And uh, we also do object recognition. We have AR markers. We have, we have all the things that, that go along with that. Yes, we do use it a lot. And that's going to be one of the critical elements in the, the device really understanding where you're at and supporting you in the optimal kind of way um, to do your work. And computer vision is a critical element to make that happen, besides a few others. Thank you very much, Percy. Awesome, as always. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.